Okay, welcome back to uh, Project Highlights with Ethereum. Uh, today we have uh, Preston Bine with us. Uh, Preston, you want to introduce yourself, yourself quickly? Yeah, hi. I, I'm basically, um, my name is Preston Byrne. I'm a securities lawyer uh, living and working in London where I do uh, pooling and, and selling of contractual debt for banks and financial institutions. And um, I started getting involved in Ethereum around about February. Mm -hmm. When Charles Hoskinson and company all uh, all kicked off over here, I've done some writing on the subject, particularly relating to the uh, legal applications, fully legal applications of smart contracts. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the moment, I'm working on a number of projects, um, both in the context of my practice, so obviously I can't discuss those, but also outside of practice um, and in the context of Ethereum, uh, specifically the Bitcoin Foundation Replacement DAC oh. um, with uh, Casey Coleman and Dennis McKinnon. So, it, and it's all very interesting. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about this. What's the, the Bitcoin Foundation Replacement DAC? So a chap named uh, Olivier Janssens, after the, um, after the Bitcoin Foundation had its annual meeting in Amsterdam this year at, the, mm -hmm. at uh, Bitcoin 2014, where I was in attendance, he put up a 100,000 pound bounty or $100,000 bounty in Bitcoin, of course to create a software platform that replaces the Bitcoin Foundation. Mm -hmm. And so that, that involves a couple of things. Firstly, you need a DAC which is very capable um, and operates on trustless principles and uh, that's very complex to code at the moment because no one's really figured out how to do it before. Right. In addition to that, you need to tie it in really with a legal entity and a legal structure because in order to serve a representative function, in order to get someone on the phone, um, and hold policy positions, you know, you, you need a, a, a central, we hate to call it this, but it's a central point of failure, but it's also a degree of centralization. Mm. So mm. the approach that we're taking is that we're not actually out to replace the Bitcoin Foundation. I think what they do, they do very well. Um, to date, their, particularly their advocacy work has been excellent. Um, but what we're doing is we're trying to develop something which can serve as a test bed, really, for community-based governance which can also have legal structures in place, which means that the legal entity will be obliged to act in certain ways in relation to the DAC um, without necessarily fettering its discretion as a, you know, a board of directors can't say, we will follow the DAC in, in all cases. Um, because at that point, they're not exercising the powers of the company, which is something that they're required by law in most jurisdictions to do. So it's really an experiment to see how we can start using decentralized computing in traditional corporate applications. Um, whether it be decision making, we're not going to. It's not. There will be no issuance of shares, no issuance of debt. This is not a crypto equity project. It's merely a consultation project where we get people with smart contracts to actually participate in an experiment mm -hmm. of running an organization that runs itself on smart contracts. So, if if there's no issuance of shares, how do you then deal with things like voting, for example, voting mechanisms on on particular actions the DAC might want to take? So the, the, the structure that we've come up with is that the DAC would actually be a captive of a charitable organization. So in the U.S., if we do it there, um, a 501c3, or if in England, a community interest company. So there's no shareholdings there, but what you do is you have boards of directors who are obliged to carry out the, you know, their functions in accordance with the organization's purposes. So there's no share ownership, but what we do is we have, we're going to create a mechanism where people are able to trustly, trustlessly communicate their wishes and their views, um, weighted to a certain extent on their reputation within the community, and the board will then be obliged um, by entering into a trustee to consider those decisions in, in making its own decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and the real benefit to that is that there's no way you can really fraudulently build a sort of political or policy consensus because you can see, because all the instructions are trustless, who's done what, how, what they've said, and the board can't then turn around and say, well, so let's say the community says we, we want the board um, of the association to, uh, to support, um, well, I don't know, a particular, let's say support law reform. We want this particular money laundering provision to be opposed. Mm -hmm. So someone puts it to a vote. The community then says, right, cool. They vote in favor of it. That message is trustlessly generated by the voting DAC. Um, the board then sees it, and then the board really can be held to account if they turn around and go, no, we're not actually going to resource this. Um, the community can say, hold on a second, you had a consensus. Um, can you please explain to us why you haven't done that? And so more traditional mechanisms, polling online, you can spam that, you can create mm -hmm. you know, spam accounts, sock puppets. When you start doing it and building in costs on Ethereum and start using crypto ledgers for this purpose, um, that becomes much, much harder to do. Right. Um, and particularly when those votes are paired to individuals who have certain reputation weightings within the community on the basis of their contributions to it. So if they code uh, particularly well, uh, the idea would be that on the basis of contributing code, they'll eventually be able to contribute more code directly. 
um, because they'll have proven themselves in the eyes of everybody else that they're capable of doing it. So the mechanism really is creating something where a corporation can be advised what to do by the cryptocurrency community um, and seeing how that relationship plays out, seeing what friction arises, seeing how we can make that more efficient. Um, because ultimately you can't, when you start dealing with corporate governance, you're dealing really with very qualitative things mm-hmm. uh, because there are actions which you can't boil down to code. There are long-term strategies, hiring and firing decisions. And our goal is to set up the first consensus mechanism and say, guys, test the daylights out of it. And after we run it for three or four months, let's see how we can make it better. Let's see how we can make it more efficient. And let's see if we can actually talk after doing this for six months to a year to regulators in various jurisdictions, to banks, to businesses, to schools, to governments and say, hey, guys, look, what we've been running. Why don't you give this a try as well? So it's 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 really a first attempt. It would be the first uh, instance of where a legal entity uh, has some legal, legal obligations to community members as expressed through a DAC, which is trustless. Um, we pretty much cracked how we're going to do it. The legal side, the coding side is reasonably advanced. Um, and it's a very interesting project because if you do this once, you can then apply it in a range of other applications. Um, but rather like Bitcoin, it'll have to withstand four years of very consistent use and abuse before um, before I think anyone is going to start taking it seriously in, in commercial applications. Okay. And what sort of, uh, you mentioned the timeline starting with governance and transparency and then subsequently voting and then applications to, to other industries or verticals. Uh, what what do you see as the timeline for the launch of something like that? How far down the development path are you with, with Dennis and Casey? I, I mean, Dennis and Casey would probably shoot me if I, if I held on to one. Um, I think... Just keeping it very, very general here, I think the, the code base should be done in a couple of weeks, um, the very basic architecture. It's mostly done. Uh, Dennis has been very, very out in the open about his Doug platform, mm-hmm. which he developed a couple of months ago. It's based on that. Um, and the so I think the very first iteration that we're going to see on Ethereum test nets is, you know, is probably a couple of months. Um, in terms of seeing more corporate applications of the same stuff, what I... This clearly isn't going to be suited for that, and um, it'll be something which a lot of people observe and then have to make their own input, their own decisions, see where it's weak, see where it's strong. Um, and you know, it, as their sort of legal DAC legal advisor on the project, um, it's it'll, that, that's going to be an ongoing process, figuring out what the weaknesses are, what the strengths are, what consensus mechanisms work, which ones don't. Um, so it, it should be a very interesting experiment over the next six months. And okay, and will you make the code for this available publicly? Is this going to be an open source project? The, the, the intent is for the project to be completely open source, mm-hmm. beginning to end. Um, I, I'm not sure what we've talked about some intellectual property things and, and stuff like that. But I think the, the very firm intent is that this is an open source project, not a silo that's designed to make money okay. uh, for for its founders. Um, you know, and, and in terms of the bounty, we were, we were talking just before the call, Stefan, there is a, there is a bounty out, but unfortunately as a lawyer, you, you can't really accept those kinds of things when you work in a corporate organization. So, um, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll be passing on that if we're fortunate enough to win it, but, um, but no, more for Dennis and Casey, I'm sure they'd like that. It, well, they're the, they're the brains of the operation. I'm just <laughs> Brilliant. So, uh, a lawyer, which, um, which actually is really interesting because he's a lawyer who can code. And as a consequence of that, he's really very, um, he brings a very unique perspective to the project. Um, Dennis as well. Dennis is just brilliant. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with them both on it. Brilliant. Well, we're running on 10 minutes. Uh, is there a URL or blog or something like that people can go to and learn more about this? At the moment, no. Um, I think that we're probably going to wait until, you know, until even if, you know, even if the bounty goes to someone else. Um, I think that it's very likely that the project is just going to proceed apace anyway. At the moment, it's not really ready for public consumption. Um, but, uh, you know, when it is, believe me, we'll, you guys in Ethereum are going to be the first and to And we'll be posting yeah. on Twitter and whatever document you publish. I'll make sure to publish it on our Twitter feed that, so you guys get, uh, get exposure and people exposure. can learn more about the project. Exposure. We're, I think we're going to, for the first draft of everything, including the code, we're going to be after criticism more than exposure. Awesome. Uh, sort of awesome. and peer review as to, I mean, this is a peer review exercise. This is a collaborative exercise. We're just putting in the groundwork. Um, once it's out there, it's our, our hope and expectation that really other people step in and this becomes a, you know, a community project in the decentralized sense. We don't want to replace the Bitcoin Foundation. Um, you know, someone just said, can you do it? We said, you know what? 
we can. This can be done. And um, and we felt that we we owed it to ourselves um, and to the community and just because it's a lot of fun um, to actually get the thing over the line. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Preston. And I'm sure, sure. we'll learn more about this project very soon. Looking forward to talking to you later. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye.